That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Down in the Delta, the Miramax release title, which came out on Christmas Day, 1998, uh, and was is the only film uh, directed by Dr. Maya Angelou. We had never seen this film. Correct. Either of us. Um, I thought it was cute. It, you know... <laughs> I, I, excellent ensemble cast uh, for various reasons as well. But uh, I've read two of her seven memoirs, and you know, I, I don't know what I was assuming this would be, but it definitely wasn't what I thought it would be. If if Maya Angelou's goal was to make a movie about the Black American experience and have it not be melodramatic and downtrodden, and just show like. You know, like a snapshot of a family getting through some struggles and progressing. Because the story really is about progress. Then I think she succeeded. It just feels very basic. Like broad, broad strokes. Very very much so. But not only about progress, but honoring and remembering where you've come from as well. Yes, for sure. But uh, character development is not there. Um, it's just a very interesting take. And it does feel like this... Like this family in the like like this black family in the '90s living in Chicago and traveling down to Mississippi, which I'll get into the plot, told by a 70 year old woman who has had this extraordinary life and has a very specific perspective, being Maya Angelou. Like it all makes sense. Sure. Also, notably, she didn't write it. Uh, screenwriter Myron Goebel. Uh, the only uh, screenplay that he's written that's been produced to date, which I also find interesting because it's curious that this project came together as opposed to adapting, you know, something from her own life. So the basic story is it's the 90s in Chicago and Alfre Woodard plays a woman named Loretta. Loretta. She has issues with addiction. She also has two children she's raising on her own, but not really because her mother, played by... Mary Alice. ...is assisting her. Actually, Alfre and her children live with her mother. And we see her, Alfre, struggling with her addiction, struggling to find work. And this all happens very quickly where... Alfre's supposed to go on a job interview, and it does not go well. It's for, like, a minimum wage job being a cashier at a grocery store, and we find out Alfre cannot, like, do basic math. So she doesn't get the job. She's upset, and then we see her go on, like, a bender, mm-hmm. kind of like in Holiday Heart, where she ends up in, a, like, a crack house. Yeah. And literally, and her mother has to go find her, drags her ass home, and tells her, you know what? You're going down, down to the Delta, Mississippi, to live with your uncle, to get your shit together. And the way the mother is able to get Alfre and her two children down there is by pawning a family heirloom. And we can get into the significance of the heirloom, but it's a silver candelabra. They pawn it for $375, and they're told that they need to purchase it back by September 2nd, like the end of the summer. So Alfre has the entire summer down in the Delta to get her shit together and get enough money to come back to Chicago and buy this candelabra. Which has a name. Right, Nathan, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. So, Alfre and her kids go down to Mississippi. She's working for her uncle who owns a a restaurant that specializes in chicken. It's called Just Chicken, actually. Uh, And that's Earl, played by Al Freeman Jr. And And in Earl's home is his wife, Annie. Anne, played by Esther Roll. Notably, it's the last film role of Esther Roll and Al Freeman Jr. That's right. And Esther Roll's character, his wife, is suffering from Alzheimer's. And a nurse who works full-time for the family, played by Loretta Devine. Xenia. And, you know, most of the film is set down in the Delta, and it's it's really sort of inconsequential. Like, Alfre's working, she never really gets into trouble... Up until the point where the uncle realizes she's trustworthy and tells her, you know what, I'm going to step back from the restaurant so I can enjoy these last years with my wife, who's in decline. You can run the restaurant. Alfre then has made enough money to go buy the candelabra. She does, and then comes back to start a new life in Mississippi. There is one side character I didn't mention who is Wesley Snipes. Mm -hmm. He's the son of... Earl. Earl. Named Will. Who we're told is kind of like this, you know, businessman who now has his own wife and kids. And I wasn't clear where they live, but it's obvious that he doesn't come visit his dad. 
And there's no real reason given. We do hear him say that he doesn't, like his mom, because of her Alzheimer's, doesn't recognize him. So what's the point? His wife, played by Anne Marie Johnson, from, she's uh, was in the TV series version of In the Heat of the Night. She's also in Living Color. Mm -hmm. um, she is made to seem like real bougie. She even says like we don't belong here. That's never really explained or dealt with. Over an incident too. That's we need to talk about that. But that's it. It's very uh, well. There's minor drama because the chicken manufacturing company in the small town. Um, folds and that compromises potentially the restaurant and there's the community I guess rallies together to, to make, stop to, the to stop chicken that from plant from like moving locations it, it, it seemed very basic mm -hmm. but I'm just going to go through my notes first off um, the soundtrack I was not familiar with because I haven't seen the movie it's very impressive like the ensemble yeah we have like whitney houston d'angelo stevie wonder luther vandross michelle and deggio cello sounds of blackness ashford and simpson shaka khan janet jackson has a song on there and i don't know how i didn't know that but yeah and the opening song is shaka khan and mm -hmm. that's what made me think like let me look up yeah. the soundtrack because i did like the song um to me this feels very much like a 1970s made for television film it's even edited and kind of shot in a way that that makes it feel that way we're we're, we're getting into some major traumatic issues that it, it it not it's not so much patly deals with but kind of avoids it altogether a little bit just like oh all's well that ends well she just right. needs to be taken out of uh the violence of uh, the, this urban violence well specifically you're talking about alfrey as an addict and we're never clear on is it alcohol or drugs she talks about wanting to drink a lot but then we see her like smoking drugs i'm saying that because it was difficult to understand if it's like weed or if it was laced with something but then someone this is while she's in the crack house someone offers her what looks like a pipe and she says oh no that's when you know you've gone too far um, and I, you know, I've never been in a crack house, but I, I don't know. Do, do people just freely give it away like that? I don't know. Uh, yeah. But I feel like that's something, if I wrote this, I would need to research that. But I thought it was interesting that somebody just willy nilly is giving her the goods. And it's like, okay. You know, I really like Alfre Woodard. I do too. I think she was robbed of an Oscar nomination for the film Clemency. Clemency. Mm -hmm. She and, is Oscar nominated, though. And Holiday Heart is a favorite of mine. But I think, and Alfre's good at playing an addict. Or junkie, as it were. But in this movie, I feel like it's a little too... <laughs> well, the script isn't allowing her to kind of further that at all. So she, I, I do get the sense that Elfie Woodard is doing what she can. Um, I, I, I agree that I think she's doing the best she can with it. But because there's no interiority for her character, it's just like... Like we know that the dad of the children, and I'm not clear if both children have the same dad, um, like is not in the picture. But then her addiction is played so like... She's fine. She's fine. Like, like, just get her away from here and she won't want alcohol. And then she talks about it a lot. And then at a point, she befriends the nurse, Loretta Devine's character. And Loretta says, do you want a beer? And she thinks about it and goes, sure. And then she's enjoying beer without any incident. Mm -hmm. And it's never brought up again that she is having a hard time with any addiction. That seems interesting, though. I'm sure. Well, I haven't... <laughs> well, let's talk about it. So, Alfrey's two children. One of them is a boy who maybe is like... I think he says in seventh grade, so he's probably like 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. And he's a responsible young man. He's clearly living in the city, being exposed to a lot of things he shouldn't be. So he's worldly beyond his years. But he is very mindful of his mother. And he's frustrated. It's a character we see often. It actually reminds me of Alfred Wooder's daughter in Holiday Heart. Yeah. Like, very similar vibe. And then she has a daughter who's like maybe four, who is, has behavioral issues and we're told is autistic. But during the scene, because Loretta is not welcoming to Alfre or her children, because she's t interpreting it as like, now I have more work to do yeah. for and the she, same thing. She kind of does, And though. she does. But then one day, Alfre's complaining like, chicken, chicken fricassee, chicken spaghetti, chicken burgers, chicken sausage, like all we ever eat is chicken. Chicken, chicken. And, Al and Loretta goes, well, if you want to come to my house, I have like brisket, pork ribs, blah, 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 blah. So they go. And... Loretta tells a story of how Alfrey's uncle paid for the land and Habitat for Humanity built the house. So she owns this beautiful new house, free and clear. Has kids of her own. Has two beautiful daughters who are like, you know, as Alfrey says, normal. 
And then at a point, Alfre asks Loretta, when you see my daughter, what do you see? And when I tell you I fell off the couch, Loretta's character tells Alf, Alfre. Sweet as can be, though. Just as sweet and as direct as she can be. Well, I would think she's a crack baby. <laughs> and then Alfre says, well, everyone says that, but she's autistic. Aww. And I just thought even that, while was, t- you know, it was sweet. It was also like, there's so much happening. And I wish we would have maybe taken out like Wesley's character, maybe taken out the chicken plant closing down and really focused on this mother, Alfre, who has these difficulties, her addiction, her child who has special needs and how she's able to push through to build a nice life for them. Mm -hmm. And maybe part of that is getting out of the big city. Mm -hmm. But instead... But it's interesting because we don't really talk about how that just a couple decades prior would have... there were a lot of dangers about doing that, such as, you know, Emmett Till came to mind as a family that had moved to the big city and then bringing uh, yourself and your children into this. This. That's interesting because I was shocked, but also pleasantly surprised that in Down in the Delta, this film, there really is zero talk of race relations. And, you know, generally watching a film set in the 50s or the 60s, I'm always a little scared that I'll be triggered because we're going to see some awful racist shit. But in this movie... There, I mean, we only see white characters once, and that's when the community rallies to help keep the chicken plant open. But it's a very... Um, They're very peripheral, which yes. is it's, it's fine. And yeah, it's interesting, but then it's also not a film that's really about black joy to me. Yeah, it's, it has a very interesting vibe. It does, to me, feel like a very basic TV movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something, another film that does has a similar dynamic where the parents uh, in Brooklyn send their children to with, with their parents in the South is also starring Alfre Woodard with is Spike Lee's Crooklyn. Mm. But think of how vibrant those scenes are where those kids are visiting. The because there really isn't, isn't any, like, culture shock. No, none whatsoever. At, like, at all, because... In fact, when Wesley Snipes, because his character is seen as being more affluent, and we're told he is, when his kids come, we hear him explain like, oh, they have like 50 cable channels and computers and they're driving this nice Volvo station wagon. So we're kind of made to understand that he's kind of out of place in the home he grew up in. But yeah, for the main character and her children, they transition very easily. They do. And there are discrepancies because when Earl picks them up from the bus, he's telling... Uh, Loretta that they're, they're, the school system has dried up here and then at the end of the movie Thomas her son is going saying to school that there. school's going well there and that they're pushing him like like school's better here it's like okay mm-hmm. um, I do think you know again getting back to Alfred playing, playing an addict the scene where she fails the job interview was frustrating I felt bad yeah, well that her. guy's very rude to her he's very rude to her so that was hard to see but then she immediately and, and immediately I said oh she's gonna go buy some liquor mm-hmm. and of course she does and then she's boozing it up at a playground <laughs> like okay that's a choice um, okay the story of the candelabra so they keep calling this candelabra Nathan so of course you're like okay why is it called Nathan and also Mary Alice and Al Freeman Jr. are are arguing over this candelabra. Over this heirloom and how it's supposed to be passed down. It's a point of contention about who's had it because she absconded with it to Chicago. In fact, I think the biggest plot point in this film revolves around this candelabra Mm -hmm. because we get three scenes talking at length about the candelabra. Then we get like three flashbacks about the candelabra. So initially we're told it's just a family heirloom that someone's, uh, you know, like like a family member was a slave and this was something he procured. And we it's it's repeated numerous times, but then we find out the big secret that they don't want to say about the candelabra is that this family, this ancestor, stole the candelabra from their white slave master, because so there's that like that's the secret, and the reason the candelabra is named Nathan is because that family member who owned who had it, his father was sold as a slave, and the form of payment used was this candelabra. And that family member who was sold, his dad, was named Nathan. And I just thought it was so in, like, kind of odd that it would be like this secret that the ancestors stole the candelabra. Because to me, I feel like I can't imagine anyone thinking that he wasn't within his rights to do so. So I thought that was a really interesting thing that they made such a big deal of. But it, that is a, a powerful symbol. It's but... an extremely powerful symbol, but it's used... I mean, it really is the main character of this movie, Mm -hmm. but I don't think we use it in a way that 
I think it could have been used more powerfully. Yes, I think but because it's because really what the candelabra the, the candelabra symbolizes beyond uh, this family's ancestry is that it's motivating Alfrey to succeed. But what's missing is she never fails. From the moment she gets down to Mississippi, she's doing what she needs to do. She doesn't fail, and she doesn't even quite know the whole story. No, of the candelabra and. Not that I wanted to see her fail, but I was certain that maybe she was going to, like, get drunk one day and, like, you know, do something, like... Because, in fact, we're told, like, don't ever leave the front door open because El Esther Roll's character, who's senile, might walk out. And so I'm like, oh, maybe Alfrey will one night be drunk and leave the door mm -hmm. open. And no, it's her son who leaves the door open and, and Esther Roll it's, walks out and falls. It's odd because there's a character arc, but we don't ever see the growth. No, and then, like, I thought for sure maybe she would steal from the restaurant. No, she's, like, she actually has, like, good ideas about how they should run the restaurant. and She she does, but, again, it's as in no interiority. Like, does this woman want to have a love life again? What, what did, what's really going on inside for her? You don't really I know. I think the Wesley Snipes character was wasted, and we should, have had, we, we should have replaced that with maybe someone living in the town, which would have been predictable, but still probably better, a better use of character as a gentleman who maybe she builds a romance with and gives her something to... Well, something for her to scrape her claws on. Yes, you know? like, yes. Uh, yeah, Wesley Snipes, Wesley and Elfrey both uh, produced this feature, but yeah, he really doesn't have anything to do. And his wife is so rude, and there's never a comeuppance for that. No, I, I, like, I can't believe no one in this family was like, we need to get this wife together. Like, she really came down here, and the reason she stank is over something that... It was, the like, her sons and then Alfrey's son kind of fighting over this snake and the way she reacts to it is just like so unreasonable it indicates that there's this history mm -hmm. this backstory that is never explained well also the fact that this son doesn't want to see his mom because she doesn't remember him like that felt really weird it, yeah it's uh it's it's something that i that is an understandable thing but nobody really addresses it's like again we're skirting around these kind of very significant issues i like loretta's character a lot um, mm -hmm. There is a moment when, because she's kind of, it, she's almost like guiding Alfrey. Mm -hmm. Very like, gently. Very yeah. gently. Like, oh, you're having trouble with your daughter with behavioral issues. Like, it, you know, and I'm dealing with this, you know, senior with Alzheimer's. And at a point she tells her, you know, like, if you need a moment, just tell her to do something impossible. Like, go to the refrigerator and find a red grapefruit. And I thought that was so cute. And then we actually do get a scene where Alfrey tells Esther Roll's character in front of Wesley Snipes, like, oh, would you do me a favor and go get a red grapefruit? And then he's like, what? Like, again, a missed opportunity. Like, I feel like we could have really delved into why Wesley is so disconnected from his own mother. Mm -hmm. Because as far as we know, his parents raised him well and did everything they could for him, for him to get this fancy education, I presume, to then go be this fancy businessman. Mm -hmm. And there's no... I, 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 I didn't like that. Um, there really isn't much else. I don't think Earl has... A, and Al Freeman Jr., who's the first black man to win a daytime Emmy... Mm. For One Life to Live, uh, which is... And, and was in a ton of stuff. He's in Spike Lee's Malcolm X as well. I don't think it, it's... He has much to really do either. This to me is like a really lovely, like, Sunday afternoon, like, light viewing, maybe while the family's having brunch and you're not paying full attention. Like, I mean, it's just not... But I definitely felt nice at the end. Like, I was happy that it didn't take me through, through this tumultuous ride to see specifically Alfred's character do better mm -hmm. so in yeah. that regard it was very um pleasant to, to to just see this woman do better and again it doesn't have to be about miserable no. but you know kind of your complaint about the movie one fine morning it, i i think i wanted it to feel more like that it just can be this this slice of life that's intimate bittersweet uh and you know going through life's journey it is nice to see esther roll uh it, this credited as her last screen role, but she had a film that opened, I think, in 2000, that filmed, I think, before this, starring MC Light. That I'm forgetting, oh, I would that be interested. That I'm in forgetting that. the name of. Uh, I think it's an indie film. But, yeah, I, I don't know. And it's always a, a pleasure to see Alfred Woodard, of course. But What would you give this movie? Two and a half. I would give it two and a half out of five as well. I think it's fine. Anything else? Oh, I think it's funny that the restaurant is just chicken because there's actually a restaurant in L L.A. called Just Turkey that we like. Shot, well, I, I, you know, I should have checked if they're still open, but if they are, I, I would recommend it. It's on La Cienega and Jefferson. 
and um, the, everything they have features turkey. Mm -hmm. And they have turkey lasagna that I think is really good, yeah. but they're known for their turkey tips. Mm -hmm. So it's like rib tips, but turkey. Which you can get on fries. Which you can get on fries smothered with their uh, uh, special sauce. And that, they have flavored cream soda, which I appreciate. Yeah, so if anyone from Just Turkey is listening, um, you can certainly send us some gift cards in our P.O. Box listed below. Hit the thanks button, listen to our podcast. Bye. Mm -hmm.